Plans for next time are on the board here and on the syllabus. So for Monday, you're going to be reading the first 35 pages of uh, the Arabian Nights. So this is going to be um, kind of like up to the end of the story of the merchant and the demon. Um, now I know a couple people had mentioned having trouble getting this book. Does everybody have it now? You're, you're still. Okay, do you know when yours is coming, Carrington? Hopefully sometime, because I have ordered a couple things from Amazon, and it's uh -huh. been, like, delayed. Uh -huh. I was hoping to get here before Saturday, because the post office is closed. So. Okay, so to, if you don't get it by Friday, let me know, okay. and I'll, 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 I'll get you something to use. Okay. Amazon had a glitch, like, yesterday. A lot of people's orders went blown, or... Yeah, mine all got canceled yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So that that yeah that, so that, yeah that goes, I think it, it's it's just the two of you who don't have it yet. Okay. So yeah, um, that goes for you as well. If if yeah if you don't get it by Friday, let me know okay. and um, we'll arrange something else. Um, okay. So um, we do have our first uh, world building. Uh, exercise today. So Ashlyn, you were responsible for giving us a region, so why don't you tell us a little bit about it. I'm a little about, well, Nick's kind of seen it, but <laughs> So, um, my first region, I named it Plantasia, that is a play on the Latin for plant, which is plantae. Okay. Um, so, it is a temperate climate, which is typically warm and with humid summers and mild winters, um, which is perfect if you're an agriculture region. Uh-huh. And so for my region, a lot of the foodstuffs are fruit and vegetables with the fruits being apples, grapes, pomegranates, and the vegetables being eggplant, peppers, and tomatoes. And okay. we have barley and wheat. Uh -huh. And then we also have honey because we have bees. And some of the animals, uh, we have, uh, it's really like flock animals like sheep okay. and goats and um, there are hogs. Um, <laughs> so I like, here, I'll hold it up. So, sorry, Dick. You kind of can't see it. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so I have, um, at the Tethys River, the river, which is our water source for just about anything and everything. Uh huh. And then we have our beehives over here with the apple trees close to the beehives. My sacred landmark is Gaia's Grove. Okay. That is a grove of birch trees. And then um, here's like the village. This is Demetrius Inn. Uh -huh. And then I've got like the fields where we've got the eggplant, the tomatoes, peppers, the barley and wheat. And I've got pomegranate trees and the grapevines. Um, so it's really ag heavy. Clearly. Region. Well, <laughs> go with what you know. I love kids yeah, yeah. and yeah. I'm from a farming family. So for mm -hmm. me, it's like I'm going with what I know. Yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 the poet W.B. Yeats wrote that um, in dreams begin responsibilities, but I think also it's in our responsibilities that our dreams begin, right? You know, our day-to-day our -day life. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so I have a set of colored markers here that are yours to use for the moment. And you can just take a minute and go back to the uh, poster board there and put Plantasia on up there. Okay, so while she is doing that, does anybody have any questions about the reading or about the assignment for next time or like questions about anything at all, really? Is, will the vocabulary quiz be on Georgia View? That will be on Georgia View, yes. Um, it will post on Friday morning. Okay. You'll have till Sunday midnight to do it. It's open book um, and open notes. Is it time? It will not be timed, no. Though I think once you open it, you have to finish it. Okay. I think that's the way they go. But yeah, I will also, uh, like I said at the, uh, before we did our quiz here, like I will, um, I will let everybody know when it's posted. So, any other questions? Okay, well then let's 
get back into Odysseus's travels. Um, so speaking of maps, I wanted to show you something um, that I have posted uh, on Georgia View, which uh, is a map that a classicist at the University of Pennsylvania made to try to chart Odysseus's um, wanderings, right? Is it interactive now? Yeah, so okay, I, so you've already yeah, looked, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm reading and I go. Yeah, yeah. So it's a fairly simple interactive map, right? You just, you roll over or something and it tells you over here what it is, right? So thank you. This is probably something from the relatively early days of the internet. Uh, when we were just starting to figure out how you could do this kind of stuff. So yeah, so we start with Troy, and from Troy we move to the land of the Sicones, right? And these are definite, identifiable, real-world locations, right? We know now from archaeological evidence that Troy was a real place. We know where the kingdom of the Sicones was. But as far as geographical knowledge in the Odyssey is concerned, that's really about all we know, right? So they've placed Ithaca over here. Now there is a modern island, or um, there's an island that is in modern times known by the name of Ithaca, and that is where it is. But it is not, belie it is not believed by scholars to be the same Ithaca that Odysseus ruled. That we've essentially given the ancient name to a different place in modern times, right? And so there are a lot of scholars who have done some work to try to figure out exactly where Odysseus's Ithaca was. And then we've got all these other, like, you know, from this, the kingdom of the Sicones, where he comes all the way over here to North Africa, where, you know, we see the land of the Lotus Eaters. From the Lotus Eaters, we go to the Cyclopes. He places the Cyclopes on Sicily. From there, right, we find the Isle of the Winds, which who knows where the hell you're supposed to place that, right? Because it's a floating island of no fixed location. From King Aeolus to North Africa again with the Lestragones. From there to Circe's Island. From Circe's Island to the Underworld. From the underworld to the island of the Sirens, from the Sirens down through Scylla and Charybdis, then to the island of Helios, imprisonment by Calypso, being entertained by the Phaeacians, and then back home to Ithaca. Now, <clears throat> I would suggest that a map like this kind of misses the point of this central part of the poem. Why is that? Why, why, why might a map like this not actually be that useful for understanding what's going on in the central part of the poem? Or trying to fi fix everything in a real world location. Yeah, Ashley. Um, climate change and erosion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there are scientific reasons why things might not be in the same places anymore, right? Um, yeah, we do know um, that um, a volcanic eruption on the Greek island of Santorini, for example, uh, destroyed um, quite a good bit of this region, which would have been between, this would have happened between the time in which the poem would have taken place and the time in which Homer set this down, right? Uh, but I'm th there's also a non-scientific reason why a map like this might be a little problematic. Yeah, Grace. Um, I'm not sure if this is like right or anything. But it's just how I feel. I feel like it kind of like seeing it now takes away from the way I imagined it in my head. Okay. Yeah. Just did um, not picture that length. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, well, I mean, you know, we, we know that you know Odysseus essentially spends you know ten years at Troy, and then another ten at sea, right? Although most of this is spent 
uh, here on the island of Calypso um, as a kind of like prisoner slash love slave of a nymph. Though that doesn't really enter into the part of the poem that we read, right? But I think uh, you're thinking a lot around, uh, along the right lines when we talk about like imagination here, right? Um, even in the late Bronze Age, could you actually have landed on any island in the Mediterranean and encountered the cattle of the sun? Could you have landed, could you have sailed by a coastline and been lured to your death by female spirits singing beautiful songs? Would your crew have been half devoured by a six-headed monster while passing through the strait between Italy and Sicily? Are you trying to like point out that it's like taking away the fantastical elements of the story? Like, because it's mm -hmm. giving us like real world locations, it's kind of taking away from like the, the secondary world part. Yeah, exactly. We're not supposed to be thinking about this in terms of analogs with the real world, right? These are fantastic places. They're not meant to have any kind of, they're not meant to have a real world equivalent, right? So let's look, for example, at, yeah, go ahead, Ashlyn. Do I have to draw a board? Uh, yes, please. That'll give, that'll give the next person something to work with. Thank you. So let's go um, to <clears throat> page 250 in book 11, The Kingdom of the Dead. And can I give, um, can I get somebody to read uh, for start at the top of the page and she made the outer limits, right? She being the ship. <clears throat> and she made the outer limits. The ocean river's bounds were Sumerian people out of their homes. Their realm and city shrouded in mist and cloud. The eye of the sun can never flash his rays through the dark and bring them light. Not when the, he climbs the starry skies or when he wheels back down from the heights to touch the earth once more. An endless, an endless Deadly night overhangs those wretched men there, gaining that point. We beached our craft and herding out the sheep. We picked our way by the ocean's banks until he gained the place that Circe made our goal. Okay, thank you. So if we look on our map here, right, this scholar places the underworld um, about here, right? Now, can we tell? where that is given the shape of the map here. Portugal, what Spain? Yeah, it's, the, uh, it's Eastern Spain, right? The East Coast of Spain. Um, does this description sound very much like Spain? Is Spain a land of eternal darkness and mist? <laughs> yeah. It's actually it like, more like England. Yeah, okay, it sounds a little more like England, sure, yeah. But yeah, like like, yeah, so not only does this not match up with the real world place where this guy is putting it, right? Does, the, does this sound like a real world place at all? No. Yeah, this is a fantastic island, right? Now it is true that the Greeks and Romans did believe that there were certain places where a human being might physically enter the underworld. For example, um, in Italy, there's a lake called Avernus, and near that lake is a cave uh, where a uh, priestess was stationed, um, and Avernus uh, has a very high sulfur content. So it smells, I can't think of a more delicate way to put this, like basically the whole lake smells like farts, right? It gives off this abominable smell, and people thought it was a gateway to the underworld because birds and animal life that get too close to it die, right? 
So the lake was associated with death. So there are certain real world locations that have these almost fantastic properties that then you know lead them to be associated with <coughs> say the underworld. But yeah, Ashley. Wouldn't we call these places liminal places? Yeah. 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 This is a good place actually to introduce that term. Now, can you remind us, uh, since you brought it up, what a liminal space is? Uh, between place, like between light and death, between light and dark. Yeah. Between one world and the next. Yeah, a liminal, a liminal space or a liminal place um, is a place that kind of exists between two worlds, right? So you often find liminal spaces kind of like on the edge of something or where two different kinds of place meet. So for example, um, you find in a lot of medieval romances that you know a knight will encounter a fairy creature in a forest clearing, right? So a forest clearing is liminal because it's both forest and you know field or meadow, but it's also neither. So that becomes a kind of place where the human world and the fairy world come together. Uh, coastlines are liminal. It's both ocean and land and yet neither. Um, so any place that is a kind of between space where two realms seem to overlap counts as liminal. And I think the description that we're given here of you know, the location of the underworld, right, the physical location on the surface of the earth of the underworld, um, is itself liminal because where is it? Like, where are we told it is, generally speaking? Where is it relative to everything else in Odysseus's world? Give you go ahead. Coastline. Yeah, coastline, right? Look at the very first clause of the very first sentence. Away from the sunlight, um, shrouded in mist and clouds. It's like further, further back. First sentence on page two fifty. Before that. <laughs> the outer limits. The outer limits. Yeah, right. So it's on the very edge of everything, right? Right? It's between the known world and whatever lies beyond, right? And you know, don't worry about the map here, like that's not you know. <laughs> so <laughs> if it's on the, the outer limits, uh -huh. is that implying that his Odysseus's world just stops? It doesn't like Um yeah, it does imply. So that would completely contradict whoever made that. Yeah, and again, and I, I think like part of the problem is that the sense of the world that Odysseus has is one that is kind of bounded by the River Oceanus, right? What's called here the Ocean River, right? So according to ancient Greek cosmology, you know, the Ocean River kind of surrounded everything. It was the boundary of the world. Yeah. Yeah, like beyond which people did not go. Now, practically speaking, by the, you know, by the classical age, when you know, Plato and Aristotle are philosophizing about shit, um, you know, they know that the Earth is actually a sphere and that the river Oceanus is not the boundary of that sphere, right? That, in fact, you know, there are, you know, perhaps you know, be, you know, beyond the Mediterranean, other lands, right? But yeah, what we're dealing here with a concept of the Earth where it is kind of limited in this way, right? There's this kind of circle around it. And the underworld is right at the edge.
which makes it the perfect kind of entry point into the world beyond, right? So I'm going to throw two Greek world words at you that are going to, or that are frequently used to describe the experience that Odysseus has in Book 11. The first, you guys who took the uh, Tolkien class with me last semester might recognize because it also was what we used to describe the journey through Moria and the journey through the Pass of the Dead, right? Katabasis. Do you guys remember what a katabasis was? A journey to figure something out by going somewhere deep and like down into your underground journey. Yeah, it's an underground journey, specifically not just an underground journey, but an underworld journey, right? A katabasis is a journey to the land of the dead. And yeah, the purpose is generally to come back with some knowledge that the dead are holding on to that the hero then uses to advance whatever his quite particular quest or fixation is, right? The other word that we can use to describe what happens with Odysseus here, not in the, un Odysseus never really actually enters the underworld, right? He just parks on the island and summons up a bunch of spirits. So the word that perhaps more accurately describes what he's doing is Nakia. And Nakia refers specifically to the act of summoning and questioning the dead through some kind of magical ritual. So let's look at what Odysseus does here, right? How does he summon up the dead? He sacrifices a sheep and a cow. Or is it a cow? It's not a good piece of sheep and something else. Yes. A sleek black ram. Oh, wait, no, no, that's what he has to get to. He comes yes, home. he promises to re that to Tiresias when he comes home, right? Isn't it he sacrifices a goat and a ewe? Um, a ram and a ewe. A ram and a ewe. Yeah. When he talks about the victims here, right? That's what he means. Yeah, he's sacrificing a black ram and a black ewe. And he's pouring out uh, milk and honey and mellow, and mellow wine, right? So the mellow wine here is probably unfermented grape juice, which was often used in these kinds of rituals. So there's an important thing that he does here, though, before he does any of this that none of us mentioned. Where is he performing this? Like, what does he, what, what does he, what does he do before he performs the sacrifice? He uh, digs a trench with his sword. Yes, he digs a pit. So this is an example of what in archaeology is usually referred to as a chthonic sacrifice or chthonic religious practice. Chthonic, roughly speaking, means earth-based. So <clears throat> The Greeks and many of their neighbors typically worshipped uh, two basic kinds of gods, right? There were gods who lived in the sky, and there were gods who lived in the ground. Usually the gods who lived in the sky were in charge of like some of like the bigger, loftier concepts, right? So you've got Zeus, who is the king of the gods, but also, you know, the god of weather and lightning, right? You've got... Um, 
you know, the gods of war and wisdom and of healing and of um, beauty. beauty, yeah. Yeah, th things of that nature living in the sky, right? And if you wanted to make a sacrifice to the gods who lived in the sky, you, pardon? Sorry, I was saying yeah. burn things. Exactly, yeah, you burn things. Right? You build an altar, which is basically a grill, and you cook the meat on it, right? And then the people share out the meat while the gods get the smoke from the sacrifice, right? So this, there's a logic to this, right? If you want to reach the gods in the sky, you do something that's going to get their attention, right? You send something up into the sky. The gods who lived in the ground were typically, um, well, on the one hand, they were typically older than the gods who lived in the sky and were more likely to be holdovers from the ancient, like the most ancient religions. Um, and yeah, they were in charge of sometimes things like wealth, right? Like minerals that you found in the earth. But also, um, you know, they, they guarded over the spirits of the dead, they punished um, the, uh, the wicked dead or rewarded the good dead, right? Things like that. And if you wanted to reach the deities that lived in the earth, is it going to make sense to build an altar and burn something on it? Now, what makes more sense? Yeah, you dig a pit and you dump things in it, right? And over the course of his journeys here, we see Odysseus making both kinds of sacrifice, right? And whether or not the gods favor your enterprise, is often, depend, often, is often demonstrated by how they respond to it, right? So like if you're trying to say make a sacrifice to Zeus and you can't get the coals to light to cook the meat, or if you know you do get them to light, you know, maybe like you know the meat sputters or goes bad or explodes or something on the altar, then you know the sign is interpreted as Zeus did not accept the sacrifice, right? Now, in this case, what is the evidence that Odysseus' sacrifice is accepted by the gods below? The shade that Persephone allows the, sh allows the shades to come. Yeah, all the shades start crowding around the pit here, right? And what do we notice about the Greek concept of death here? Right? What are these shades like? Yeah, there's, they have no substance, right? No physical substance. And how do we know that? How is that demonstrated for us? Um, when Odysseus goes to try to hug his mother. Yeah, his it's a, yeah there's that kind of heartbreaking scene where he, he's, he tries to embrace his mother, who was still alive when he left. And yeah, their arms pass right through each other. Right? Yes, so yeah, the dead have no substance. What else do they lack most of the time? Memory. Yeah. They also have no memory most of the time, right? This is what makes Tiresias unique, is that he alone among the dead has retained his memories in the world above. Until they drink from the, the pit. Yes. They have to drink the they have to drink the sacrificial blood, and then they can remember who they were, right? So why do you think that is? What's the logic of that? How does that work? Why does drinking the blood restore memories of life to them, do you think? Because it's life. Okay, yeah. Blood, milk, honey, wine, those are all life-giving things. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I think that the blood in particular, right? I mean, like, blood is the literal stuff of life, right? It is the liquid that flows through our veins and carries oxygen to all of our extremities, right? It's something that we can't live without. And so temporarily, the shades can be restored by consuming it, right? 
And I think in some way this also fits into our broader eating and being eaten pattern, right? Um, I'm not entirely sure how yet, except for the fact that the dead are consuming the blood. And they seem to be sort of unconsciously drawn to it, right? What does Odysseus have to do in order to make sure Tiresias gets to talk first? Yeah, he has to wave his sword around and scare them off, right? Which is weird considering what? <laughs> yeah, they have no substance and no memory, right? So, one, you can't actually hurt them with a sword. And two, they probably don't even remember what the hell a sword is and why they should be afraid of it, right? So, let's look at, um, before we talk, look at Tiresias and the prophecy that he makes, right? Because I do want to make some points about Greek prophecy and the way um, men's prophecy and men's magic tends to differ from women's magic like we saw with Circe. Um, let's look at some of the uh, friends that Odysseus meets down here. Um, can I get some, let's let, uh, start with um, Agamemnon. Can I get somebody to read on page 262, starting with, now then, no sooner had Queen Persephone driven off the ghosts. Now then, no sooner had Queen Persephone driven off the ghost of lovely women scattering left and right, than forward marched the shade of Atreus' son, Ag Agamemnon. Ugh, that is a mouthful. <laughs> Atreus and Agamemnon. Atreus' <laughs> son, Agamemnon, prop to Greece and flanked by all his comrades, troops of his men at arms who died beside him, who met their fate in Lord Aegisthus uh, Hall. He knew me at once as soon as he drank the blood and wailed out. Shrilly, tears sprang to his eyes. He thrust his arms toward me, keen to embrace me there. No use. The great force was gone. The strength lost forever now that filled his rippling limbs in the old days. I wept at the sight. My heart went out to the man. My words, too, in a winging flight of pity. Famous Atreides, Lord of Agamemnon, what fatal stroke of destiny brought you down? Wrecked in the ships when Lord Poseidon roused some punishing blasts of storm winds, gust on gust, or did ranks of enemies mow you down on land as you tried to raid and cut off herds and flocks, or fought to win their city, take their women? Okay, so first thing, does Odysseus seem to be surprised to see Agamemnon here? No. Really? Well, like, he... He is, he's upset to see him, but uh -huh. then also he's kind of not surprised. Does it seem like he knew Agamemnon was dead? No. Yeah, it seems at least a surprise to him that Agamemnon is dead, right? And what else do we see kind of like about the description of the shade here? Um, he still looks as he did in the, when he was younger, you know, strong. Mm -hmm. Ripp uh, rippling limbs <laughs> and a great uh -huh. force. So he still looks as he did, mm -hmm. you know, probably when they first were in Troy together. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, I mean, he's certainly recognizable, right? Yeah. But if we look at, like, the great force was gone, the strength lost forever now that filled his rippling limbs in the old days, right? So is Agamemnon under the ground here? the mighty and lordly man that he was above. Yeah, the shade is almost like a kind of inferior copy of the man who lived above, right? right. Um, he doesn't have that, like, what is it? No, air about him. 
Uh, and it, yeah, no, no, no right, the, la the presence, the charisma, right, yeah. And the physical strength are gone as well, right, because he no longer has any physical substance. Now, can I get somebody to continue here from the field marshal's ghost replied at once? The field marshal's ghost replied at once. When the son of Laertes, Odysseus, mastermind of war, I was not wrecked in the ships when Lord Poseidon roused some punishing blast of storm winds, gust on gust, nor did ranks of enemies mow me down on land. Agathus, Agathus hatched my doom and my destruction. He killed me. He with my own accursed wife. He invited me to his place, sat me down to peace, but cut me down as a man cuts down some ox at the trap. So I died, a wretched, ignominious death, and round me all my comrades killed. No mercy, one after another, just like white tusk boards, butchered in some rich lord of power's halls. For a wedding, ban for a wedding banquet, or groaning public feast. Yep, yep, keep going. You and your day have witnessed hundreds slaughtered, Killed in single combat or killed in pitched battle. True. But if you blazed eyes on this, it would have wrenched your heart. How we sprawled by the mixing bowl and loaded tables there. Throughout the palace, the whole floor washed with blood. But the death cry of Cassandra, Priam's daughter, the most pitiful thing I heard. My treacherous queen, Cly Clytemnestra. Clytemnestra, killed her over my body. Yes. And I, lifting my fists, beat them down on the ground, dying. Dying, writhing around the sword. But she, that whore, she turned her back on me. Well, on my way to death, she even lacked the heart to seal my eyes with her hand or close my jaws. Okay, so we can pause there, right? So let's look at the death scene here that Agamemnon describes, right? What seems significant here, given some of the things we've already talked about? Um, you violated guest rights. Okay, yeah, violation of hospitality, right? Aegisthus, his, who is Agamemnon's cousin, um, it doesn't tell us this here, but you know, if you know Greek mythology, that is the relationship. Right, so Aegisthus has violated the laws of hospitality. And is that the only rule that is violated here in Agamemnon's killing? Who else participates in his killing? His wife, yes, so the laws of the oikos are violated as well, right? The wife rising up against her husband. also part of like just to give you a little bit of background on the Agamemnon Aegisthus relationship this is part of a long-running feud between their two families so Agamemnon is the son of a guy by the name of Atreus and Atreus had a brother Thyestes both of them claim to be the legitimate king of Mycenae so Atreus wins the civil war between the two of them, exiles Thyestes, and then later on invites Thyestes back for a kind of uh, peacemaking uh, reunion. And Thyestes is brought to a feast uh, before which he is separated from his two sons. He and Atreus eat the meal together. At the end of the meal, Thyestes asks where his sons are, and Atreus points to the plate. So, yeah, this is a, a, yeah, a, a, another reference to this cannibalism taboo in Greek mythology, right? And Aegisthus is then a son that Thyestes fathers later on, right? So yeah, so he and Agamemnon are cousins, but they are not friends, right? Their two branches of the family are at war with each other. But Clytemnestra, by uh, sleeping with her husband's enemy, is violating a further bond there as well. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, um, 
Oh, oh, sorry. I'll go until you finish. Uh, does it doesn't quite a mess. Quite a mess. Oh gosh, I hate these Greek names so much. <laughs> Agamemnon's wife doesn't she also violate some type of like divine thing? Because Cassandra was a or she was a prophet, mm -hmm. so she was you know like protected by Apollo. So by killing her, doesn't that also cause some divine? Interruption or something? Well, Clytemnestra will eventually be murdered by her own son. Okay. Um, so eye for an eye. I guess it all kind of evens out, kind of evens out, <laughs> and then he will be pursued by the Furies for years until the gods decide to forgive him. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a whole kind of messy family saga here, right? That only bits are alluded to here. But I figured that the Atreus and Theeste story was important to relate because of what it has to do with other themes in this text, right? Because it, it's kind of you know, closely related there. And given, again, like that kind of subtext as well, I think it's also important to note what Agamemnon and his men are doing when they die. Feasting. They're feasting, yeah. They die at the feast. And indeed, before he describes the, the feasting hall, right, he says, you know, so I died. Uh, wait, he invited me to his palace, sat me down to feast, then cut me down as a man cuts down some ox at the trough, right? So Agamemnon and his men are butchered as though for a feast, right? In the feasting hall. So this relationship between human beings, or human flesh, and food carries through here as well, right? What's that? These people are something else. Serving up your nephews. Uh huh. Killing people around food. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to disagree with you. But I'd like to now point to something that is also particularly telling about Greek afterlife concepts. If we look on page 264, um, can I get somebody to start reading? Uh, actually, just start reading at the top here. She's much too steady, her feelings aren't too deep. Uh, Agamemnon is describing Odysseus's wife here. She's much too steady, her feelings run too deep. Carvis is daughter Penelope, that wise woman. She was a young bride I well remember. We left her behind when we went off to war. With an infant boy, she nestled at her breast. That boy must sit and be counted with the men now, happy man. His beloved father will come sailing home and see his son, and he will embrace his father. That is only right. But my wife, she never even let me feast my eyes on my own son. She killed me first, his father. I tell you this, bear it in mind, you must. When you reach your homeland, steer your ship into port in secret, never out in the open. The time for trusting women's gone forever. Okay, keep going. Enough. Come tell me this and be precise. Have you heard news of my son? Where is he living now? Perhaps in... Orcomenos. Orcomenos, perhaps in Sandy Pride. Illos, or off in the Spartan Plains with Menelaus. He's not dead yet, my Prince Orestes. No, he's somewhere on the earth. Okay, so this is important, right? What is the thing that Agamemnon most wants to know? What, what information does he want from Odysseus? Is his son Odysseus? Yeah. What about my son, right? Tell me about my son. Now remember that shades in the Greek underworld have no substance and no memory, right? Unless they get some semblance of life by drinking the blood. Why does he care so much about what's going on with his son? Because if his son's alive and continues to remember him, then he's remembered. Exactly, right? Yes. What goes on in the underworld... This comes through a lot in Achilles' speech that comes next, right? Does not matter, right? Once your life is over, 
for the most part, it seems according to the Greek concept of things, you have nothing more to contribute, right? Unless you happen to be a magic man like Tiresias. But yeah, for Agamemnon, for Achilles, right? This is, this is it. This is all they get, you know, an existence of flitting around in the dark without substance and no memory of who they used to be. So what matters is that your legacy continues above ground, right? What matters is that you still have sons carrying on your line. And so all of the shades down here are obsessed with knowing what's going on with their son, right? Even Odysseus's mother, right? She died of, you know, of grief over her son's absence, right? So one more thing I want to point to about the kingdom of the dead, and this is something that we see in Tiresias' speech directly. Right? And so what we're going to... What we're going to be looking at here is something that has to do with the nature of Greek prophecy, right? So remember back to the end of last class. What was the last thing we talked about on Monday? Does anybody remember? What was the one thing that ruled fate. the lives of humans and gods? Yes, fate. Okay. Good. So keep that in mind, right? What is fated to happen will happen. So page 252, bottom of the page. Moving back, I thrust my silver-studded sword deep in its sheath, and once he had drunk the dark blood, the words came ringing from the prophet in his power. A sweet, smooth journey home, renowned Odysseus, that is what you seek. But a god will make it hard for you, I know. You will never escape the one who shakes the earth, quaking with anger at you still, still enraged because you blinded the Cyclops, his dear son. Even so... You and your crew may still reach home, suffering all the way, if you only have the power to curb their wild desire and curb your own, what's more, from the day your good trim vessel first puts in at Thrinacea Island, flees the cruel blue sea. There you will find them grazing, herds and fat flocks, the cattle of Helios. God of the sun who sees all, hears all things. Leave the beasts unharmed, your mind set on home, and you all may still reach Ithaca, bent with hardship, true, but harm them in any way, and I can see it now, your ship destroyed, your men destroyed as well. And even if you escape, you'll come home late and come a broken man, all shipmates lost, alone in a stranger's ship, and you will find a world of pain at home, crude, arrogant men, devouring all your goods, courting your noble wife, devouring, um, offering gifts to win her. So do we notice particular words and phrases repeating in Tiresias's prophecy here? Yeah, which we'll see in a second, right? He doesn't. You will make it home, but there will be hardship. There will uh -huh. be less hardship if you do what I tell you and don't kill mm -hmm. the oxen. And I think you, you just you hit on a key word there that keeps popping up in Tiresias' prophecy, right? If. Right. There's a lot of if and may in this. Right? He makes a lot of conditional statements. So he doesn't say, this is what will happen. Right. He says, if you do this, then this. But if you do something else, than this, right? So what does that tell us about the Greek idea of fate, right? The end point 
is predetermined, but is how you get there predetermined? There's multiple paths. There are multiple possible paths, yeah. So it does allow for some level of free will and choice, right? If you leave the cattle alone, then all of you will reach home safely. If you don't, then only you will get home and you'll be alone and broken, right? We saw the same thing when the Cyclops cursed Odysseus, right? Um, you know, he said, you know, so, you know he, there's an if-then statement in there as well. It's like, well, if he be fated to make it to his native shore, then let him do so with pain and hardship, right? That seems to be about the most you can prophesy according to these kind of Greek systems of magic. That's about as far as it goes. Now, what does Tiresias prophesy as the trouble spot for Odysseus and his men? What's the terrible choice they have to make? That actually doesn't sound that terrible in Tiresias' phrase, is it, right? What's the one thing they must not do? Yeah, exactly. They have to resist their urge to kill and consume, right? And he even places a reminder here to Odysseus of what's happening in his home while he's away, right? While you are trying to find your way back home, all of these arrogant young aristocrats are converging upon your hall and your wife, right? Eating all of your goods, drinking all of your wine, and trying to convince your wife to marry one of them, right? So there is, kind of like, again, this, kind of this underlying sense of this Greek warrior elite as takers, right? And if they can curb that urge, to simply take, they'll get home safely. And if we know anything about myths or fairy tales, right, what do we know is going to happen when some magical guide tells you not to do something? You're going to do, do it, right? You might do it by accident. You might do it because circumstances force you to it, right? But you're going to break that taboo. Right? Once the taboo is given, it is almost certain in a plot structure like this that it's going to be violated. So let's look at the circumstances around the violation of this taboo. Right? So they're, they're blown onto the island. Right? They have avoided Scylla and Charybdis, right? both of which are eating monsters. Charybdis is a giant whirlpool that sucks everything down, right? Scylla is a six-headed beast that just kind of pulls men off the ship. If we look on page 279, right? But now, at last, putting the rocks, Scylla and dread Charybdis far astern, we quickly reach the good green island of the sun where Helios, Lord Hyperion, keeps his fine cattle, broad in the brow and flocks of purebred sheep. Still aboard my black ship in the open sea, I could hear the lowing cattle driven home, the bleating sheep. And I was once uh, struck once more by the words of the blind Theban prophet Tiresias, and I and Circe too. Time and again they told me to shun this island of the sun, the joy of man. So I warned my shipmates gravely, sick at heart. Listen to me, my comrades, brothers in hardship. Let me tell you the dire prophecies of Tiresias, and I and Circe too. Time and again they told me to shun this island of the sun, the joy of man. Here they warned, the worst disaster awaits us. Row straight past these shores, race our black ship on. So I said, and the warnings broke their hearts. But Eurylochus waded in at once, with mutiny on his mind. You're a hard man, Odysseus. Your fighting spirit's stronger than ours. Your stamina never fails. You must be made of iron head to foot. Look, your crew's half dead with labor, starved for sleep, and you forbid us to set foot on land, this island here, washed by the waves, where we might catch a decent meal again. 
Drained as we are, night falling fast, you'd have us desert this haven and blunder off into the mist-bound seas? Out of the night come winds that shatter vessels. How can a man escape his headlong death if suddenly, out of nowhere, a cyclone hits, bred by the south or stormy west wind? They're the gales that tear a ship to splinters. The gods are masters, willing or not, it seems. Now, no, let's give way to the dark night. Set out our supper here. Sit tight by our swift ship, and then at daybreak, board and launcher, make for open sea. Now, whose argument on the surface here makes more sense? Odysseus's? No, we must stay away from here because magic people told us, to, told us not to land. Or Eurylochus's, right? We're hungry, we're tired, and there's a safe harbor here. True, but also after suffering all this stuff with Odysseus, and I would have been like, oh, the magic man said no. But the crew never seemed to learn the lesson, right? Like, Go ahead. Circe's warned you. Did his prophet shades warned you? Uh huh. Like, come on. Let's let's just pass it, tough it out, baby. Uh -huh. Let's go home. Mm -hmm. And they almost do, right? And then, <laughs> Until weather circumstances force them uh, to linger on the island longer than expected so their food stores run out, right? Good old Poseidon. You better learn to fish leave those islands. <laughs> <laughs> you know, take up fishing. It's, yeah. a, good, it's a good hobby. Uh, vegetarian. Eat some grass. <laughs> but again, like fishing and farming aren't what these guys know, right? How how have these guys gotten every meal we've seen them eat? Hunting. Yeah, hunting Steal or stealing. Yeah, hunting and raiding is what they know how to do, right? Walk out to the sandbar with your spear and you, uh -huh. <laughs> and you walk back up. Yeah. So if I think we're kind of pointing it like. Kind of, I think what the central problematic here, like particularly surrounding this theme of eating and being eaten is, right? Is that, you know, we've got a class of people that is kind of bred to be useless for anything except killing and consuming and vengeance and vendettas, right? And I think that what, what's going on with the island and the cattle of the sun is like the way to defeat that challenge, right? is to not give in to those impulses, right? To check those violent impulses. And because they don't, because they can't do that, they sow the seeds of their own destruction there, right? Okay, so we are about out of time, so I have some reading questions for you for next time. Right, so you're gonna be reading the very beginning of the Arabian Nights, so the stories of Sharazad and Sharayar, and of the, uh, the merchants and the demon. And of course, all the stories that are nested within those. Because it is like the, the, um, the narrative is constructed like a Russian doll, right? There are stories inside of stories.